Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. And I am your host, Jesse Tapia. Alright. So, I might have been wrong about some things. Okay. I was wrong about some things. If you check the title of our show for Monday... It reads, the Rockets might be done. Okay. That came from their game three loss to the Warriors. Might have been a little little premature from me right there. All right. I didn't say they were done or anything like that. I said they might be done. But nonetheless, you get what I was hinting at. A couple of days pass. Now we here we are to Wednesday. And you can read the title, the new one for today. Title reads, the Rockets are not done. Okay, and yes, the Rockets are not done. The Rockets surprised me. I didn't think they had this in them, but it turns out they do. Okay. So now, we got ourselves a series. Do I think that the Rockets are going to win this, ser- this series? I do not. I'm still sticking with the Warriors, okay? The same way I'm still sticking with the Celtics, even though I've lost all faith in that pick, honestly. Alright. Warriors are still have faith in. Because either way, the Rockets win game five. Warriors can Warriors will win game six. And then we'll be back here for game seven. And anything can go down game seven. Warriors win game five. Series is over in six. Alright. But I will say this, like I said. I didn't think the Rockets had this in them. I didn't think they could make adjustments in order to beat the Warriors. But they did. So we're going to spend the first segment talking about that game. We're going to spend the second segment talking about game four between Boston and Cleveland. That one was quite something, let me tell you. All right, so we'll spend the second segment recapping that one. Okay, third segment, we got the all NBA or the all defensive teams coming out and the all rookie teams coming out. We'll be talking about those, give my thoughts on them. All right. And then for the fourth segment, we're going to preview tonight's game between Boston and Boston and Cleveland, game five. And then maybe we'll talk briefly about game five between Golden State and Houston since we won't be able to talk about it the day of, which is tomorrow. All right. But like I said, I mean, I didn't I didn't think Houston was going to be able to pull this off. I really didn't. Okay. Houston's a good team, but it's just, other than game two, they haven't looked good. It just seems like game two was one of those where the Warriors just came out flat, and that's all it was. All right, But nonetheless, um, for game four, Rockets come out with a seven-man rotation, and it works. Warriors didn't have Andre Iguodala in there either, but we'll talk about that after we get into the stats and all that of the game. So yeah, game four, Rockets end up winning 95-92. to for the Rockets, you had Trevor Ariza, who had nine points, three rebounds, one assist, one steal, and one block. Did a little le- little bit of everything. Finished two of four from the field, two of three from the three-point line. P.J. Tucker took four shots, didn't hit one of them, but did get to the free throw line four times and hit all four of those free throws. He finished with 16 points, four po- um, 16 rebounds, four points, excuse me. Also had two assists, two steals, and a block. Clint Capella, he finished with 8 points, 13 rebounds. All right, he shot 2 of 5 there. Let's see, he got to the line 5 times, hit 4 of those. Chris Paul had 27 points, 4 assists, 2 rebounds. Shot 10 of 20, 5 of 9 from the 3-point line. This was a big game for Chris Paul here. All right, like I said, finished with 27 points. 
he he was pretty much carrying that team in the second half, I feel. Okay, James Harden really couldn't buy a bucket when it mattered. And Eric Gordon was struggling. I mean, he only went one of eight from the three point line. Did hit a clutch three, his only three at the um, towards the end of the in the fourth quarter, I believe it was. But nonetheless, yeah, Chris Paul comes out and he was hitting pretty much any shot he wanted in the second half. It was honestly fun to watch. And this is what we'd like to see more out of Chris Paul, just taking over. Okay, he's easily a top five point guard all time. But it's just a matter of sometimes when it comes to playoffs, he doesn't really show up or he doesn't play as well as he should. But this was one of those games where he did. All right, so he played 42 minutes. James Harden played 43. First half, he played about as well as you could, okay? Ended up finishing the game below with 30 points, four assists, four rebounds, three steals, two blocks. He shot 11 of 26 from the field, three of 12 from the three-point line. All right, and this was one of those games where, like I said, James Harden in the second half really just couldn't buy a bucket. It was a lot of iso ball, too, that he was trying to play. One of those where he's just dribbling up to the three-point line and then pulling up for three. It wasn't working out. But a big difference that I did see in Game 4 compared to Game 3 with James Harden was his effort on defense. All right, Like I said, he finished with three steals and two blocks. Usually you don't see that from a guy like him. All right, So that was big of him to come out and play defense. I mean, this whole team did well as far as their effort on defense. Okay, Eric Gordon off the bench played 35 minutes, um, had 14 points, shot 4 of 14 there, 1 of 8 from the three-point line. Like I said, I mean, at one point he was 0 of 7, I think it was. Ended up hitting a uh, real clutch three um, towards the end of the game. And then Gerald Green played 12 minutes, had three points, two rebounds, had two blocks, also forced a turnover late in the game. That helped um, as far as them sealing up the win. He went one of four from the field. All those came from the three-point line there, so that's why he finished with three points. It was a plus 14 out there, which was a team best. All right, he only played 12, 12 minutes, but, I mean, played 12 meaningful minutes. No Ryan Anderson, low, no Luke and Bob Mute, no um, Joe Johnson in this one. Eric Gordon, Gerald Green, the only two to come off the bench. And it was a strategy that worked out for the Rockets. For the Warriors, you had Draymond Green with 11 points, 8 assists, 14 rebounds, 2 steals and a block, shot 4 of 8 from the field. Kevin Durant had 27 points, 12 rebounds, 3 assists, shot 9 of 24, 1 of 5 from the 3-point line. Kevin Looney had 4 points, 5 rebounds, shot 2 of 6, got the start since Andre Iguodala missed this game with an injury. Steph Curry finished with 28 points, 6 rebounds, 2 assists, 2 steals, shot 10 of 26, 6 of 13 from the 3-point line. Klay Thompson, he had 10 points, 4 rebounds, shot 4 of 13, 2 of 5 from the 3-point line. And then off the bench, you had Jordan Bell, who finished with 6 points, 5 rebounds, 1 steal, and a block, shot 3 of 4. Sean Livingston played 15 minutes off the bench. He had 4 points, 3 rebounds, shot 2 of 5. And then you had Nick Young, who played 13 minutes, had 2 points, shot 1 of 3 there. All right. I mean, watching this game, Warriors jumped out to a big, not a huge lead after the end of the first quarter, but we're up nine, and you had the Rockets, who I don't think scored until like they were five minutes into the game. All right, and I mean, if you look at each quarter, it was like first quarter was Golden State outscored um, Houston twenty eight nineteen, second quarter Houston outscores Golden State thirty four to eighteen, third quarter Golden State outscores Houston thirty four to seventeen. And then the fourth quarter, Houston outscores Golden State 25-12. to 12. All right. So no one team, I would say, played well consistently throughout the game. It was just a matter of Houston kept it close. All right. It was close after the first half. And, I mean, people were getting excited about, I'm like, let's pump the brakes a bit now that we finally had a close game. But it's a matter of Golden State, I knew, and I'm sure everyone else knew, that they were going to go on a run. Okay, they were going to bring it back to double digits. And and again, it's not something where it's like, oh, like I knew it was going to happen. Oh, yeah, you knew, knew it was going to happen because that's what they always do, Golden State. They always have this one run in a game where you got to keep it close because you're not going to be able to stop them during that stretch. Okay, and that came in the third quarter. I mean, Steph was hitting three after three. Clay was hitting his shots. And you could literally not stop KD as far as him taking a mid-range shot. It was ridiculous. Okay. And it just seemed like it was pouring on. Like I said, the Warriors outscored the Rockets 34-17. to All right. Warriors are up in the fourth quarter. And it just seems like, you know what? They finally got it. All right. They got the Rockets. Rockets played about as well as you could, but it's over. No, it wasn't. Fourth quarter comes. And like I said, Chris Paul played about as well as he could. Was hitting threes. Was hitting mid-range. Was getting to the, um, the rim. Driving in. I mean, he played about as well as you could. There was one play where time's winding down. 
Chris Paul's got the ball in the corner, and you figure he's just waiting to take that last second um, shot. Two Warriors come to help on him. He ends up throwing a nice pass on the baseline about. Didn't really have much room to make that pass, too, because he was literally at the very edge of the baseline in the corner of the three-point line. Throws it down. One bounce. Gets to Trevor Ariza, I believe it was, or Eric Gordon, and he ends up hitting a three. All right, that was a huge play right there by Chris Paul. That was one of the few times where you get excited by a pass. All right. So now they ended up taking that game. And with the Warriors, I mean, during that run in the third quarter, they're honestly a ridiculous team. Okay, it's, it's as a fan, it's always kind of scary just to see these guys. Like, you can't, they can't miss. All right, someone's always going to be open. Someone's always going to hit the shot. But nonetheless, Rockets took care of business. They stayed in it, and they ended up winning this one 95-92. And also, at the end of the game, you got the Rockets who are up 90, 93 to 92, or 90, yeah, they were up 94, 92, okay? Warriors go down to get the last shot. KD, for some reason, passes the ball up. Clay gets it. They're playing good defense on him. He misses, all right? Chris Paul gets the rebound, but then he gets fouled. There's .5 left in the game, all right? Rockets are up by one, or two, 94, 92. Chris Paul gets to the line for the first free throw. He misses. Okay, again, there's only .5 left. The Warriors do have a timeout, but with the time it would take for them to grab the rebound and then call timeout, you got to think there would not be .5 left. It'd be around .2 or .3. Okay. So I'm thinking, you know what? Chris, If I'm Chris Paul with the second free throw, I'm missing it just because it'd be almost impossible for the Warriors to get a shot off after they get a timeout. Okay. Chris Paul ends up making it. Now, no time comes off. Still .5 left. Warriors got a timeout. They use it. They advance the ball up the court. I'm thinking, you know what? They messed up. Warriors are going to get back into this. Someone's going to hit this shot. Because that's usually how the basketball goes for the Warriors. Steph Curry gets about as good as a look as you can get with .5 left. It was open. It was just he couldn't get it to fall in. So, yeah, Rockets ended up winning 95-92. But just that point right there in the game is like, oh. This was a classic Chris Paul mistake right there. But turns out it didn't come out to hurt him. So can't really get frustrated there. But either way, like I said, Rockets end up winning 95-92. Now we're heading back to Houston for game five. I mean, they got a shot. They got a chance. All right. I underestimated them big time. So we'll see. But either way, we're going to wrap it up here. Next up, we're going to be talking Cavs Celtics game four from Monday. So stay tuned and I'll be right back. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We spent that first segment talking Warriors-Rockets game four. Rockets surprised everyone by winning that game, okay? If you're a Rockets fan, you're probably saying, oh, they didn't surprise me. No, there's no way going into that game you thought you had any chance at winning. There's no way, all right? Given the beating that they had in game three, I didn't think the Rockets were going to be able to take a game in Oracle. I'm not going to lie. I'll be the first one to be wrong about that, but... Yeah, they ended up pulling it off, 95-92. I don't know, it just feels like James Harden in that series, too, hasn't really been as good as you'd like him to be, I think. All right, like, yeah, he put up 30 yesterday, but, I mean, where were you for the fourth quarter? Okay? I feel like he was just missing shot after shot there. Chris Paul doesn't go on the little um, run that he had. They don't win that game. All right, but I guess it does work out that way when you have two superstars. One's not playing well, the other's going to pick up his slack. So, 
I guess that's why we got teams, right? But either way, like I said, now we're 2-2 going back to Houston. I don't know. I might be picking Houston for game five. All right. But I've been picking against them all series long, so I'm sure the fans want me to continue doing that. All right. So we'll see if they're able to pull it off. But, I mean, this series is a whole lot different than I thought it'd go. Let me tell you. And, again, I just might have severely underestimated the Rockets. But I feel like I had my reasons. All right. But either way, now let's talk. head over to the Eastern Conference Finals. Let's talk Game 4 between Boston and Cleveland. This game took place Monday night. We haven't had a chance to talk about it yet, so let's do that. So like I said, Game 4, Boston looked terrible Game 3. And there really wasn't much of a difference for Game 4. All right, Celtics ended up losing to the Cavs, 111-102. to For the Celtics, you had Marcus Morris with 10 points, 3 rebounds. Shot 4 of 8, 1 of 2 from the 3-point line. Finished the game with 5 fouls. Al Horford had 15 points, 7 rebounds, 1 assist. Shot 5 of 13, 1 of 3 from the 3-point line. Again, whenever Al Horford doesn't play well, the Celtics lose. Okay? That's the key to beating them. Stopping Al Horford. You do that, they really don't have a shot. Alright? And also it just seems you play them on the road. when Oh, you play them when they're on the road. They're not going to win. Jason Tatum... A guy who has actually been pretty good on the road compared to all these other guys on the team. He ended up finishing the game with 17 points, 2 rebounds, shot 5 of 13, was 7 of 8 from the free throw line. Was pretty invisible for that game, okay? Ty Lue and the Cavs did a good job of pretty much making him invisible and taking him, taking him out of the Celtics game plan. Terry Rozier played okay in this one. He had 16 points, 11 assists, 6 rebounds. Also had three steals, shot six of 15 from the field, three of nine from the three-point line. I mean, he did have a plus three out there, okay, which was a team best. But it's just the point where it's just not as, he's not, he's not as good as he would be if he was at home. All right. He played 39 minutes in that one. Jalen Brown had played 40 minutes. He finished the game with 25 points, two steals, two assists, six rebounds, shot 10 of 23, two of six from the three-point line. Jalen Brown, I feel, took a lot of threes way too early in the shot clock. And one of them happened, I think, when the Celtics were down by six, I think it was, or seven around there, late in the fourth quarter. All right, they're on a run, and I feel you just kill the momentum when you're taking a three, like, about five seconds into the shot clock. That's very uncharacteristic for the Celtics right there. Okay, usually they're a team who will take the shot clock down, run their play and all that, but it just seems like they were taking way too many, too many early threes in that game. Off the bench, you had Semi Ojale, who played nine minutes, was one of two from the field. He had three points. Aaron Baines played 16 minutes in this one. He had eight points, seven rebounds, shot two of three. And then you had Marcus Smart, who played 31 minutes off the bench. He had eight points, five assists, two steals, five rebounds also, shot two of eight, one of five from the three-point line. And then Greg Monroe sat the bench in this one. Celtics finished the game shooting 41% from the field, 32% from three. Obviously not great. And as for the home team, the Cleveland Cavaliers, you had LeBron who finished with 44 points, two steals, three assists, five rebounds, shot 17 to 28, one of four from the three-point line. It's ridiculous when this guy drops 44, like this guy will drop 40 plus and it just won't be a story because it's something that we're all used to. All right. Kevin Love, he finished with nine points, 11 rebounds, three assists, shot four of 12 from the field, one of four from the three-point line, finished with six turnovers and five fouls. Kevin Love hasn't looked good so far in the series, but it really hasn't made a difference for the Cavs. All right, they figured out figured out other ways to win. Tristan Thompson, he had 13 points, 12 rebounds, also had two blocks, one steal, shot six to ten, was a plus nine out there, which was tied for a team best. I mean, him, George Hill, and LeBron were both plus nines out there. Speaking of George Hill, he had 13 points, four rebounds, three assists, two had two steals, shot six of nine, one of three from the three point line. George Hill's been very, very good the last two games. Again, they're at home, and it seems that role players tend to play well when they're at home. So I guess now we got to see if he can carry it over into Boston. J.R. Smith, I've come to realize, is just J.R. Smith. Okay, He's not going to be a real productive player for you or anything like that, but he is going to hit shots when I guess it matters most. He finished with 9 points, went 3 of 9 from the field, 3 of 6 from the 3-point line, had 3 rebounds, 3 assists. I mean, no steals, no box, or anything like that. So it's just a matter of when JR is going to hit a three, it's going to mean something. All right. And then off the bench, you had Larry Nance, who played 10 minutes. He finished with seven points despite only taking one shot, 
Went 5 of 7 from the free throw line. He finished with three rebounds, one assist, one steal, and two blocks. Jeff Green played 20 minutes. Wasn't great. I mean, he had two points, five rebounds, shot one of five. And then you had Kyle Korver, who for me has been the Cavs' second best player this entire series, or this entire postseason. He had 14 points, four rebounds, shot four of seven, two of five from the three point line. It was ridiculous. The Celtics couldn't track him. All right. He was open way too many times. Um, as far as getting shots up, and it was just one where even if you had a hand in his face, he was still hitting it. All right, so like I said, I mean, Kyle Korver for me has been their best player, second best player so far this postseason. Jordan Clarkson only got four minutes in this one, didn't take a shot or anything like that, and then you had Rodney Hood who sat the bench in this game. Rodney Hood is a decent player, but I don't think he's a good fit on this Cavs team, so I think it was time for him to fight a spot at the bench, and I think it was time for Tyler would finally make that decision, all right? But anyway, the Cavs ended up finishing the game shooting 50% from the field, 34% from three, 30, nearly 35. They ended up finishing the game with 18 turnovers, two the Celtics with only nine. And usually when you see that, the team with the most turnovers, especially if it's that big of a difference, is going to end up losing. But it was one where the Celtics on offense just played very uncharacteristically, all right? Like I said, they took way too many threes early on in the shot clock. Okay, and they they just for some reason refuse to drive into the paint, and even when they do get into the paint, they're missing easy easy layups, stuff that should be going in. All right, and I'm not sure what it is. And another thing too with Game Four, I think I put a lot of the blame for that game on Brad Stevens. All right, and we've been singing his praises all postseason long on this podcast, but nonetheless, he had some moves in that game that were pretty questionable. All right, and it's going to be interesting to see what changes he ends up making for Game Five, whether it be through the lineup or in-game adjustments. But I do think it is time for a lineup change. All right, and like I said, we're going to be talking more about Game Five for Celtics Cavs there, so I'm not going to get too much into it. But as far as Game Four, I mean, you got Marcus Smart, who we all know that no one's going to be stopping LeBron. Okay, it's going to take LeBron just having a bad game himself for him to play poorly. But you could throw guys on him that could frustrate LeBron and at least try to limit him. And a guy that can do that is Marcus Smart. Or at least that's what he was showing in Game 4. Okay, LeBron necessarily wasn't getting the licks he was getting all game. Yeah, he was still hitting shots. But but you could tell that he was working a little bit harder to get those. Alright. And that's one thing you need if you're the um, if you're the opposing team going up against LeBron. You just needed him to work. Marcus Smart was making him do that. You could tell he was frustrating LeBron. All right, so the Celtics are going on a run in the fourth quarter, playing well. Marcus Smart's contributing, and first thing Brad Stevens does is he pulls him. All right, I think that was a bad substitution right there. And I'm sure everyone thought that was a bad substitution. You got ESPN during that span of Marcus Smart being on the bench, just keep going to him. All right, keep putting the camera in his face. They knew it was a bad move, and they knew it was going to cost the Celtics. Everyone knew it was going to cost the Celtics. All right. Now, I'm not going to go and say it cost Celtics the game because, I mean, they really had no business winning that game. They were the second best team. All right. The fact of the matter is, some of that game is on Brad Stevens. He needs to do better as far as making his adjustments earlier in the game. Okay. As far as everything else goes, I mean, maybe you look to play Aaron Baines a little bit more in game five, but. A big problem with the Celtics team is that they haven't looked good in the road. All right, for Game Five, at least they'll be back in Boston. But there's a point where it's cool that you're nine and zero at home. But when you're one and seven on the road or one and six, whatever it may be, you're not really going to be too successful. Okay, I'm more confident in the Cavs for Game Five than I am in the Celtics. All right, Celtics just haven't looked great at all on the road. And I say the longer the series goes, the worse it's going to be for the Celtics. LeBron's already been here before. He knows what it takes in order to get out of a ser- series. We saw it in Indiana, and we saw it against the Raptors. Okay. And with the Celtics in Game 4, it kind of looked like they were just a team who were... It's just the Cavs got in their heads. All right, You saw slumped shoulders, bad body language. They just looked defeated. Looked like they had no answer as to what you could do to stop this Cavs team. 
All right, and when that happens, usually the series is over. Okay, when you're out there and you everyone can visibly see, yeah, that guy's defeated. Yeah, there's nothing he can do. All right. So now I guess it's just a matter of we got to wait and see what ends up happening for Game 5, which we're going to talk about more so in the fourth segment. All right. But, yeah, Games 3 and Games 4, very, very different compared to Games 1 and Games 2 for the Celtics. And as far as the Cavs go for Game 4, I mean, they played with effort. Kyle Korver was making hustle plays on defense. He was getting blocks. He was getting steals. All right. The whole team put in more effort. And that's something that we could have saw all season long. All right. One of the Cavs' biggest problems this season was their defense. And it was just a matter of they need to put in more effort to make it, get some stops. And that's what they were doing. As far as switching, closing out on threes. All right. Going straight up when people are in the air. I mean, they did pretty much all the intangible stuff there. So we'll see if they're able to pull it off for game five. Like I said, I mean, I'm more confident in the Cavs right now than I am in the Celtics. So we'll see what ends up happening. But we'll talk about game five more so in the fourth segment. But next up, we're going to be talking about the all-NBA rookie teams and the all-NBA defensive teams next. So stay tuned, and I'll be right back. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G smcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. So far today, we started off talking Rockets-Warriors Game 4. Rockets ended up winning that one 95-92. Warriors had a chance at the end to tie it up. They had two chances at the end to tie it up. Once before, actually, once before to win it. Second time was to tie it up. First time was when they were up or down 94-92 to the Rockets. All right. You see KD bringing the ball down the court, and for some reason he passes it up rather than just going to take the last shot, gives it up to Clay. And Clay, that game too, really looked like he was being bothered by some type of injury. I mean, he left the game early on with, I think it was an ankle or knee injury, but either way, when he came back, he really wasn't looking good. All right, so I don't understand KD giving him the ball at the end. Maybe it was something where KD was just being a little too unselfish there. All right, so I end up getting it up to Clay. Rockets play good defense on that play, and Klay Thompson just pretty much misses it as poorly as you could. Chris Paul gets the ball, gets fouled, hits a free throw. Warriors call timeout, advance it up the court. Steph gets an open look, but just couldn't hit it. All right, so yeah, the Rockets ended up winning that one, 95-92. And, I mean, it's a completely different series now that they're heading back to Houston, tied 2-2. I didn't think that was going to happen. I figured this series was coming back 3-1. All right, so I was wrong about that. Houston's playing well. Played about as well as you could on defense yesterday. Okay, James Harden really wasn't looking good for the last two for the last half of the game. But nonetheless was coming up with a lot of stops and playing solid defense in that game too. Something that we haven't really seen from him ever, honestly. Alright. And then for the second segment, we talked Celtics Cavs game four. That one took place on Monday, so I'm sure we've all seen you've all seen it, but nonetheless, Cavs won that one one eleven to one oh two. Celtics have completely gotten away from everything that they've done in the first two games, and I'm not sure if it's more so just they're not ready to be, like, just given the young team that they are, not ready to compete on the road. But it's not looking good for them, and it's just one of those things where they look defeated in Game 4. But I guess there is a difference going on the road than playing at home. So now they'll be back in Boston for Game 5. They're 9-0 right now at home. I'm not much sure how, how much longer they can keep that little undefeated streak. All right, if I try to say who I was most confident in tonight, it'd have to be the Cavs. 
All right, Celtics really didn't show me anything in the last two games to show that they get what they need to do or whatever. Okay, after game three, sure, you got blown out. You lost. Make adjustments for game four, and it just seemed like they stuck with everything that they did that night in game three. All right. So, yeah, right now it's 2-2. I got to say the Cavs have all the momentum right now. As far as who, as far as who has the momentum as far, um, between Houston and Golden State, I'd say it's Houston, but... I mean, Houston or Golden State could easily just pick it up and win game five. So we'll wait and see on that. But nonetheless, like I said, both series tied at 2 2. We'll talk more about game five between Boston and Cleveland in the next segment. But for this segment, we got the all NBA rookie team, or the NBA all rookie team, and the NBA all defensive team. Let's look at the rookie team first, give my thoughts on it, and then we will give my thoughts on the all defensive team. All right. So the all rookie team, first team was. Consisted of Donovan Mitchell, Ben Simmons, Jason Tatum, Kyle Kuzma, and Laurie Markkinen. I think they got every selection there right. Okay, I'm looking at the second team. I don't think any of those guys deserve to be in the first team or at least deserve to be in over any of these um, rookies on the first team. Donovan Mitchell and Ben Simmons were unanimous selections. Jason Tatum nearly was. He had 99 first team votes out of 100, so that means he only had one second team vote. I'm not really sure who it was that voted him for second team. Okay, and I'm not sure which Ricky on the second team you'd go out and say was better than Jason Tatum. All right. But nonetheless, I mean, it probably should have been three guys who were unanimously unanimously selected for that first team. All right, because I think we could all agree that Ben Simmons, Donovan Mitchell, and Jason Tatum were all the top three rookies this season. And after that, there's a bit of a gap between everyone else. All right. And honestly, I think this is going to end up being one of the best rookie classes of all time. Donovan Mitchell's already leading the Jazz. Ben Simmons is already the best player on his team, one of the best players. And Jason Tatum was a guy who, in this playoffs, has led the Celtics to get as far as they've, been, they've gone. All right. And I'm very curious to see how Jason Tatum plays tonight. He's been real quiet these last two games. So, yeah, I like the three there. Kyle Kuzma. Guy who came from the Pac-12 from Utah. All right. No one really thought much about him going into the draft or even into the summer league. But nonetheless, he plays well in the summer league. Earns himself a team spot on the roster. Okay. And eventually, like I said, works his way to making the first team all rookie team. All right. And if we're being real here, I think that he was the Lakers best rookie this season. Lonzo Ball played well. He made the second team. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But Kyle Kuzma was one where... I mean, he was putting out consistent performances all year long. All right. Lonzo wasn't. But nonetheless, yeah, I like Kuzma being there, the first team. And then Laurie Markinen, Laurie Legend. All right. He ends up making first team also. And that's probably the most underrated rookie this season. No one really talked too much about him at all, just given that he doesn't have the flashiness or the hype surrounding him as like Alonzo Ball, Jason Tatum, Ben Simmons, or Donovan Mitchell. But he's a guy who played extremely well this season, and he is a guy who um, the Bulls could build around. All right, so I like the pick there. I don't think there's any snubs for the first team. I think all those guys were deserving over everyone else. And then for the second team, you had Dennis Smith Jr., Lonzo Ball, John Collins out of Atlanta, Bogdan Bogdanovich out of Sacramento, and then Josh Jackson out of Phoenix. All right, I do like the this second team. I'm perfectly fine with it. If there's anyone who got snubbed, I'd say maybe it was Dylan Brooks. Okay. I mean, OG Anunoby, player for the Raptors. He did have a solid season. I saw that was some who people said was a snub, but I, I don't know. I think Dennis Smith deserved to be in there. Okay. Same with Bogdanovich. Lonzo Ball finished with 10, 7, and 7 this season, and that's, I don't think we've really seen too many rookies do that. All right, and I'm sure, I think with Lonzo Ball, his expectations were a little bit too high. I guess the expectations that people had for him. So, I mean, probably didn't live up, but nonetheless, he did have a real solid season. Maybe you throw in Jarrett Allen instead of John Collins, and then Dylan Brooks possibly instead of Josh Jackson. But again, I don't have any real problems with the second team. Some guys could make the argument, yeah, they got snubbed. But again, I mean, this rookie class was re- really good, okay? The 10 rookies that I named for the first and second teams all had solid years. 
Bam Adebayo is going to be a solid player for Miami. Darren Fox is the starting point guard of the future for the Kings. OG and Nunaboy played well for Toronto. Jarrett Allen was a very good player for Brooklyn. Dylan Brooks was a very good player for Memphis. Jordan Bell's already getting himself solid minutes with the Warriors in the playoffs. All right, Royce O'Neal played well for the Jazz. Zach Collins was good for Portland. Milos Teodosic was good for the Clippers. And after that, that's where you got you guys who were kind of off and on. Luke Kennard, Frank Mason, Malink Monk, Frank Nielakina. Semi Ojale got a second team vote. And then you had Sidarius Thornwell. All right. So this rookie class was actually very good. A lot of tons of good players. And that's why I think it's probably going to end up being one of the best. But nonetheless, there's that. And then there was the all defensive team, first and second. All right. So you had first team Rudy Gobert. Anthony Davis, Victor Oladipo, Drew Holiday, Robert Covington. I don't got any problems with that first team. All right. Rudy Gobert could end up winning the Defensive Player of the Year award. All right. Probably the best rim protecting center in the league. Not really a guy who can come out to the perimeter and guard that way, but more so, I mean, anyone who tries to drive in and score on him isn't going to succeed. All right. Every. Rudy Gobert seems to be the kind of center where, with well, the kind of player where I think we all know how good he is, but no one really wants to give him that respect yet for some reason. All right. Anthony Davis, I mean, one of the best players in the league. I have no problem with him being up there. Victor Oladipo probably should end up winning most improved player of the season. All right. Was, was Indiana's leader, their best player of the season. And, I mean, maybe it was just the change of scenery that he needed. I know Indiana's his hometown and all that, his home state and all that. But nonetheless, I mean, dude had a real solid season. Robert Covington struggled a lot on the offensive end this season, but is one of the best defenders in the league, so I'm fine with him being there. Same with Drew Holiday. All right, and then for the second team, you had Joel Embiid, Draymond Green, Al Horford, Deontay Murray, and Jimmy Butler. Maybe Draymond Green could have found himself up there in first team, but I mean, who are you gonna? You're not. I don't think you're gonna put him over Rudy Gobert or Anthony Davis, given the seasons that they had. So it's just one of those circumstances where, yeah, you were really good, but there's not really a spot there. All right, Joel and B. I think second team is perfect for him right there. Al Horford could have made the argument that he could should be a first team player, but then again, like I said, I mean, it's tough when you got Anthony Davis and Rudy Gobert there. Jimmy Butler, always a guy who's going to be in the running. All right, this is his fourth all-defensive selection. This is Jamon Green's fourth. And I think, yeah, Anthony Davis has got the second most with three. But nonetheless, I mean, all these guys are deserving here. So I don't think there's any really true snubs. All right, you can always throw guys like Marcus Smart out there or anything like that. But I think the NBA got it right as far as their selections there. All right. But I do think that Rudy Gobert is going to be the guy who probably ends up winning the Defensive Player of the Year. And that is going to be well-deserved for him. So we'll see there. But nonetheless, I mean, I'm fine with both teams selected. Could make the argument that other guys should have been in there. But I think the guys who made it are deserving. So we're going to wrap it up there. Next up, we're going to be talking about Game 5 between Boston and Cleveland. Talk about what both teams needed to do to come out with the win. And we'll probably talk about Houston and Golden State and talk about what those teams need to do to come out with their win in their game tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. And I'll be right back. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. All right, and welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. So far today, we've talked Rockets-Warriors Game 4, we talked Celtics-Cavs Game 4, and we talked about the all-rookie teams and the all-defensive teams in the NBA. All right, 
don't think there was any real snubs or anything like that. You could make the argument maybe this guy should have made it or maybe shouldn't have, but I don't think there's any real true omissions here. All right. And as far as both Game 4s, I mean, Rockets winning was surprising. Of course, the title we had on Monday show was the Rockets might be done after the Game 3 lost. And of course, as sports go, now the title is the Rockets are not done for today's episode. All right. As far as the Celtics go, they've been borderline garbage on the road. Not borderline. They have been terrible on the road. Okay. So now here we are for game five. Back home for them. All right. I'm not sure. Like I've been thinking about the game. Okay. About my pick throughout the last couple of days. And I don't know. I just my faith in the Celtics winning this game. Okay, because I have Celtics winning in seven, but as far as how I'm feeling tonight about it, I got to say the Cavs got to be the favorite. I mean, Vegas right now has the Celtics by a point, which I don't really understand. All right, I get that they've been so good at home. I think they're 9-0 and so far in the postseason. But there's a point where eventually you are going to lose a game at home. All right, and I'm thinking that this might be that one game. Okay. The Celtics, if... They would have just lost game three and made adjustments for game four. Then maybe I would have been different. But they made, I don't, I don't even really th- even think they made any adjustments for game four. Okay. They went into it with the same game plan as game three and nothing really changed. All right. I mean, the Cavs had nine more turnovers than them and they still won by nine. The Celtics completely got away from driving into the paint, getting um, um, points that way. Or even kicking it out once you get to the paint. Making the extra pass. Moving the ball around. There's been way too much iso ball. There's been way too many threes being taken early on in the shot clock. Alright. And this is where you miss a guy like Kyrie Irving if you're the Celtics. Okay. And I really think that this series is starting to put away all the hot takes of do the Celtics even need Kyrie Irving? Do they even need Gordon Hayward? Which was just ridiculous to begin with. Okay. When the Celtics offense goes cold, who's out there to go out and get his own shot and get his own points like a Kyrie Irving would be able to, all right? They don't have that one guy. It's all team basketball here, all right? Kyrie Irving's not able to go out there and hit a shot from mid-range, hit a shot from three, drive in and get some points, and that's what's hurting the Celtics right now. Like I saw like yesterday in game four between the Rockets and Warriors, James Harden wasn't really playing too well in the second half. Couldn't really buy a bucket. But you got a guy like Chris Paul who can go out there and pick up his slack and keep the team in it. All right. The Celtics lack that superstar right now. And that's what they lacked the last couple of years. Okay. When you had Isaiah Thomas out there playing well, now you throw the double team on him. Who else is going to go out and get you some points? It wasn't going to be Avery Bradley. It wasn't going to be Jay Crowder. Isaiah Thomas was the only guy who could go out and create his own shot. All right. And with the Celtics team, people say, oh, what if they were shutting down Kyrie Irving? If you're shutting down Kyrie Irving, you're at least keeping the defense at least uh, you're at least keeping the defense honest. Okay. Kyrie Irving can easily drive in, draw a double double team, and kick it out to like a Jalen Brown or a Jason Tatum. That's the difference there. All right. But since they don't have that, they tend to go on these little cold streaks, in which we've seen the last two games in the first quarter and the first half for that matter. All right. So for tonight, the game plan's gotta be get Al Horford more involved. Okay, figure out a way to take Tristan Thompson away from him. All right, whether that be putting Aaron Baines out there. And if I'm the Celtics, I'm really looking into starting Smart is Smart. All right. I get that he's a spark off the bench, but you do need scoring off the bench. And he doesn't give you that, and neither will Aaron Baines. Marcus Morris will give you scoring off the bench. Okay. And if you throw Marcus Smart out there, this would be the lineup I would throw out there if I'm um, Boston but then again it's tough because Cleveland is going bigger with Tristan Thompson but if I'm Boston I'm at least looking into the starting lineup of Terry Rozier um, Jalen Brown Jason Tatum Marcus Smart and Al Horford all right I'm saying that you could throw smart on lever Bra- or lever LeBron okay and if you throw smart on LeBron and I'm sure you could have Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown go up against Kevin Love all right, and you just have Horford and Thompson battle that out. But again, there's a size mismatch there. So I guess ideally, they'll probably end up going with the starting lineup of um, Rozier, Brown, Tatum, Horford, and Baines. Okay, throwing Baines on Thompson and throwing Horford on Love. And I think that's something that could work out in the Celtics' favor. And that's probably something they should have done at least in Game Four. All right, at least looked into one of those two lineup changes. Okay. 
That way you have at least Marcus Morris coming off the bench where you're going to have some production there. Sammy Ursula is a guy who I'm sure the Celtics expected to do a little bit more scoring as far as coming off the bench being a 3 and D guy. He's obviously struggled shooting the 3 this year, and that's something he's going to have to work on this offseason. So, I mean, he's only really a defensive specialist out there. All right. Marcus Smart is, you never know if he's going to be on it. Okay. And like I said, Aaron Baines just doesn't give you that offensive presence there. So we'll see what ends up happening. But like I said, Celtics got to get back to what they did games one and games two. And as far as Cleveland goes, I mean, the only thing they need to do is just put it, keep putting in the effort. Okay. All these guys got the ability. George Hill is a very good point guard, was a huge um, piece to Utah's offense last season. Okay, LeBron's always going to go out and get his. Kyle Korver's been extremely good for the po- um, Cavs this postseason. And it's just a matter of, like I said, putting the effort on on defense. All right, coming up with the switches. Staying in their face. All right, going up for rebounds and all that. And like I said, as of right now, I mean, the Cavs for me are the favorites for tonight. And I think that's my pick is Cleveland. All right, my pick for the series is still Celtics in seven. But, I mean, if Cleveland were to win tonight, I don't see how Boston ends up taking game six. But nonetheless, it's still a possibility. So, that's why I'm sticking with Celtics in seven. But, tonight, I do like Cleveland. All right. And, honestly, like I said, in game four, the Celtics look defeated. I'm curious to see if that's going to carry over into game five, if they're going to be ready to go. All right. This is one where it's either you fold or you step up and play well. I have no clue what the Celtics are going to do tonight. So, yeah, as of right now, I got Cleveland winning tonight. And I feel like that's pretty fair. As far as the game tomorrow, game five between Houston and Golden State, Houston literally needs to do everything that they did in game four for game five. Literally that, okay? The effort on defense, the share of the ball, okay? They were still running their ISO stuff and all that, but nonetheless, you saw they were swinging the ball around and it wasn't more so one-on-one the entire time. They were running an actual offense and they should have been doing that a long time ago, Okay? Literally got to go out, play hard, same amount of effort you had in game four and game five, and like I said, swing the ball around. Because it's not like Trevor Reza or P.J. Tucker shot the ball well at all in game four. P.J. Tucker didn't hit a shot, Trevor Reza only hit two. Eric Gordon went four or 14 from the field. I think Jalen Green was one of four. It was pretty much the Chris Paul and James Harden show. Okay, but nonetheless, when you got the ball moving around a bit, it's going to keep the flow of things working. It's always going to keep the defense honest. All right, so that's what they need to do for game five there. I kind of want to go with Houston for game five, given that they got the momentum and given how well they played in game four. But I think I am going to stick with Golden State. But like I said, I mean, I would not put it past Houston winning game five. They can very well do that. All right. So we'll see what ends up happening there. But as far as other news going on in the NBA, Doc Rivers got an extension from the from the Clippers. I have no problem with that. I think Doc Rivers is a very good coach. Okay, maybe a little overhyped, but nonetheless, a guy who was coming into the final year of his contract. And I mean, the Clippers are going through a bit of a rebuild right now. Okay, and the Clippers, as of right now, are a fringe playoff team. They got two draft picks late in the lottery. I think it's the 11th and 12th pick. If I'm the Clippers, I'm looking for a way to package those two picks and try and move up. Okay, maybe you move up with a team like the Bulls. Or the Magic, possibly. Take a guy like Mohamed Bamba. All right? Because I think they'll probably be losing DeAndre Jordan this offseason. Because I think he has the opportunity to opt out. And if I'm DeAndre Jordan, I'm looking into the possibility of maybe just playing for the other LA team. Given that he'd be a good fit there, I think, with Lonzo Ball. All right? But it's a point of, yeah, if I'm the Clippers, I'm maybe looking, since I'll be losing DeAndre Jordan, looking at using those two picks to maybe move up and get a guy like Mo Bamba. All right? But even then, so... You could just keep those picks because I think you can get some players in those in those um, low teen picks. All right, as far as the 11th and 12th pick, so I don't have a problem with them extending Doc Rivers. They still got a solid team there, and I think he does know how to get the best out of talent. So, like I said, there's no problem there whatsoever with them bringing him back. And I mean, the Clippers could be a playoff team next year. All right. Plus, you got guys like Austin Rivers who had a solid season this year with the Clippers. You got Milo Teodosic, Ricky, who played well. Okay, so they said so Darius Thornwell also played well, Ricky. And then you got Tobias Harris, Avery Bradley, who's going to be coming back, who has already played under Doc Rivers. And um, they got a bunch, yeah, they got a bunch of young talent there still. 
Lou Williams, who's there for th um, three more years. So, yeah, if I'm the Clippers, I'm looking to see maybe if I could move up. But if not, I mean, you'll still get some good players with those two picks there. All right. But as far as everything else goes, like I said, we got Celtics, Cavs tonight. I'm picking the Cavs. I just, I just don't trust Boston right now. All right. I don't at all. And I think that their road record is just going to come to bite them. Um, come back to bite them, just given that, I mean, you can't go 1-7 and seven in the postseason on the road. Okay, that's just something that won't work out. All right, so we'll see what ends up happening, but we're going to wrap up the show here. Today we talked Rockets-Warriors game four. Rockets won that one 95-92. Celtics-Cavs game four. Cavs won that one 111-102. Third segment we talked about the all the NBA all-rookie teams and the NBA all-defensive teams. And then for the fourth segment, previewed game five between Boston and Cleveland. Talked a bit about game five between Houston and Golden State. And then talked about Doc Rivers getting an extension there. All right. So thanks for listening to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. I will be back Friday to recap both games and then talk about anything else going on in the NBA. So stay tuned and I will talk to you guys later. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program